about building maintenance. It doesn't seem like it's possible. It was 12 years ago that that uh, building was built. Well, that, you know, I, we have to give a lot of credit to Bill Gay, okay? And, and it's one of the things I'd really like to highlight uh, through the process here is very, you know, we get a lot of accolades for the work we do, and we have an outstanding police department. I would argue it's the best police department in the state of New Hampshire. But that doesn't happen without some of the folks like Bill Gay, Pete McKinnon, who retired. Uh, we just lost Marsha Hess, those people uh, that are the support mechanism. So the police officers can go out and do the police work um, and come back to a building that's clean, uh, a booking room that's clean because of the, the, the hazmat issues we have or the cruises. These people do miraculous work and they, they just don't get enough credit for it. But that's why that building works as good as it does 12 years later. And I'd, I'd like to say that um, maintaining the, the two wonderful new fire stations, maintaining the police department, I would rather you maintained it than uh, the issue that we have, for instance, with the wastewater treatment plant, is, which is something that we're going to get to next the next time we meet. But I'd rather that the public buildings are maintained properly. You know, the um, the other thing I wanted to mention under administration with um, computer supplies, there was a line about. Um, let me go back here. Something that I saw that caught my my eye under computer support. Um, annual internet service website email. DSL connection? You're using DSL? No, no, I'm sorry. A lot of these line items, as we said, as Tim has pointed out, don't accurately reflect sometimes because things get put into a line. And as we work through it, no, it's not a DSL connection. Okay, I didn't think so. I mean, the DSL is like, that would be very old. Um, what is it? DSL? Well, I know what DSL is. <laughs> what is it if it's not DSL? I know it's not DSL. <laughs> Tim, as we know, I'm not a tech guy. Uh, I can find out for you get back to you what the connection is. Through, uh, yeah, and you can update the template, so next year we won't ask the question again. Yeah. Thank Every you. Every year I'm cutting <laughs> a little bit out that you, that you go Every after. year we add a little bit of help for you, right? And I get rid of a lot. <laughs> Keep the eight tracks out. <laughs> I had one other thing under uh, training. And... Um, First, I have to find it in here. Anybody know what page that's on? Training. 26. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I just wanted to mention a training and recruitment, and then it lists in the book on page 27 um, the, the amount of, um, of just, I thought it was astounding, the cases of uh, ammunition for training. You know, you, you guys go through a lot of lead, huh? We do. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, let me explain that to you. We are required, each officer in the state of New Hampshire is required by police stands and training to qualify once a year. That is an incredibly substandard, in my opinion. I get why they do it, because they're the governing body for the entire state. That includes the smallest de department up north that you can think of, all the way to Manchester State Police, us, Salem, the bigger departments. It's not sufficient, in my opinion. Uh, and the other thing you got to remember is there's a high turnover rate in law enforcement across the country. And many of the people coming in have never use the firearm in their life. So that takes a considerable lot more training and some, what was the term we would use for that with people that are struggling? <coughs> <laughs> Retraining or uh, more one-on-one -on -one time with an instructor as opposed to being lined up with six other officers. <laughs> We're trying to really work with the people that are coming into the field and it's a, it is a different group of people these days. It's just, that's not good or bad, it's just the way it is. So they do need more one-on-one -on -one time. They do need more time on the range and more acclimation to firearms because they just don't have that uh, in their previous life. I guess the uh, the other thing that I noticed going through this line by line, the 60 cases of handgun training ammunition is different than the uh, duty the, the duty ammunition. Yes, what that is is the fa uh, 
it's a less of a standard ammo. The ammo that you get uh, if you went to into a store to carry in your own handgun, there's all kinds of different uh, ammo that's available. We use an, an, an ammo that we believe is ballistically sound for our purposes as law enforcement, whereas the target ammo is what could be what the military would refer to as a ball round. <clears throat> so when you go to a military training, the ammo you may fire through a training is not the same ammo you may load into your weapon if you're going out into the field into a combat situation. Greater ballistic penetration uh, with the duty ammo as opposed to a ball round. It's a different ballistics, but it suits the need for punching the hole in the paper and getting the person acclimated and trained to be accurate with it as opposed to the duty round. So that's why the duty round is much more expensive. I think it's very interesting. I had a, uh, a friend once that was a policeman in one of the communities, and I said, how often do you fire your gun? Oh, we go through cases of, uh, of ammo. It, 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 I was amazed. I was amazed at how often you end up, you know, using your weapon. Um, you don't have to tell me how many times you... <laughs> but it was quite amazing. It's a, it's a liability issue. We have to make sure that the officers are trained properly, accurately, and we've added so much more. We have we have a great group of, of trainers at the PD, quite frankly, that, again, not to brag, they're probably the best in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, the police academy frequently calls upon us to come up and support them uh, through police academy training because of their training and expertise. So uh, it's just one of those things we take that very seriously. Um, it, it's a liability shield for the town to make sure these officers train consistently, and that's why. Yeah. It's, this quite, it's quite a list of uh, these items that you end up buying that, you know, civilians, we don't, I, w I was reading this and I thought, my God, you know, look at all this stuff, rifles and, and uh, bean bags, bean bags that you shoot out of the, all kinds of, this, it's, it's an amazing list of uh, items. Anyway, that's all I have. Anybody have any questions? David? Just a quick one. You said you got to train other at the academy. Yes. Does he get paid for that? No, I use I do that as a support to the police academy. I believe it's essential uh, for all of us in the state to make sure that we put out the best police officers we can in the state. But it's right, like a volunteer program. It, it, we it's do it as a cooperative venture with the police academy because the other thing you have to remember is the police academy budget, like everybody's budget, is really tight. And there's no way the police academy could offer the level of training they offer free of charge to communities if it wasn't for communities being willing to send officers up Where's to assist them. It's in Concord. It's on the campus of NHTI. Is the state police involved with that too? State, every police officer in the state of New Hampshire goes and has to be certified to a different entity. It's not part of the Department of Safety. It's not an entity of the state police. It's called the New Hampshire Police Standards and Training Council. They are the governing body for all law enforcement in the state for uh, certifications and what that entails. So they run the police academy as a separate entity. Every officer in the state, from fishing game to municipal to sheriffs to state police, goes to the same academy. Bob? I'd ask you the same question as the fire chief. Are you satisfied the safety equipment is state of the art for officers? I think we do a, a, a very good job with keeping ourselves current with technology. Um, it's keeping people trained in that technology is the hardest part. Uh, again, we experience the turnover rate, and so we have to spend a considerable amount of our time getting these people up to speed and competent so they can go out and work in one of the, the most challenging law enforcement environments, I would argue, in, the, in all of New England. Just to see them shortly thereafter, we've after one summer or two, so we have an old whole new batch of people coming in. And again, it's just, it's not, when I came on the job, there was a lot of people coming out of the military, there was a lot of people with life experience. We're, because of the competitiveness of officers, we hired nine officers, part-time officers this year, but we're already at negative three. Okay, so I hired three of our part-time officers full-time. <coughs> UNH took two, Manchester took two, the Massachusetts State Police took two, two ordinary res resignations, and one that uh, did not meet his probationary period. We just, it was not uh, suitable to go forward with this person any further. 
and one just uh, left last week to say that. So actually, I'm at negative four. Even though I hired nine, I'm at negative four in my part-time ranks. And that's not going to change for the foreseeable future. So knowing that, it's one of those things we use technology to the best advantage we can. But every time we add technology, it adds training. You remember a couple years ago, we were finally able to get funding to provide tasers to all our part-time officers, which prior to it was only full-time that carried them. Today, it's, it's, it's a rarity to see an officer anywhere that's not carrying a taser. Mm -hmm. Yet we had more than half of our sworn officers walking around without one in a, an environment where we use walking beats. We are with the public. We are amongst the public more than any other department in the state for a 12-week period. Not many departments still have walking beats. We do. Uh, just because of the environment we work in. So we have to use technology, but with technology comes expense of the technology, but making the officer competent. So I think we do a good job with it. I don't, there may be some things we're looking at in the future, uh, plate readers and stuff for the cruises have now been legalized in a limited fashion in the state, so we may be using stuff like that. Uh, and if we can use technology to offset the lack of officers, then we try to do that too. My other question would be, as the emergency management director, considering how complex emergency management has become, have we reached a point where we should have an emergency management committee? Well, under state statute, the town is required to have a, an emergency management director. It can often have a committee in support of that. But it can't be, the emergency management function can't be run by a committee. There has to be somebody, um, a chain of command, if you will, to deal with the issues when, it, when anything man-made or natural uh, disaster goes beyond our capacity to handle this community. There has to be somebody that's the primary liaison to the state or federal entities that will come in and support us. So the committee would be helpful in formulating those plans, but we do have a, a, an emergency management team you know, we do the radiological drills for the Seabrook plant. It involves me as the emergency management director. The deputy chief then steps into the role as chief of police, the fire chief, uh, a lot of fire support personnel because we're in their building, the RADEF officers, uh, public works director, the assistant director handle the transportation function. So there's a lot of moving parts to it. There's nothing that says you can't use civilian folks for that. Uh, you see some communities do that. You see some communities have a civilian separate entity emergency management director as opposed to putting it on the hat of somebody in public safety. There's a, there's a school of things we could do. Right now, this is the system we've, had, we've been using for years. I've received no inclination that that's going to change in the foreseeable future, but I guess it's a topic that people could always discuss. I just see the burden on you getting more and more difficult <coughs> because you're getting out of pure public safety in the immediate sense, you're getting into zoning issues and flooding issues, evacuation on, on massive scales. It's the paperwork that is now becoming um, difficult to manage in that realm. Prior to 9-11, we had, you know, New Hampshire Emergency Management. It has now morphed into New Hampshire Homeland Security and Emergency Management. So they have delved into far greater areas such as school safety. Schools are now required to have a safety plan that meets a criteria established by New Hampshire Homeland Security and Emergency Management. So we have to get involved with that, not only as the police department and fire department, but also in our emergency management function. Um, any grants or funding or reimbursements, those Anything you get for federal dollars somehow comes attached with something. Okay, if you want highway safety money, you have to do certain things that they tell you to do. And you may not want to do them as a community, but if you want those dollars, you have to comply. It's kind of similar to why every state in the country has a drinking age of 21. It's not, people think it's a federal law. It's not a federal law. Every state has had to enact a statute that mandates the alcohol consumption level to be 21. And if you don't, you don't get any federal highway funding. The state of Vermont several years ago actually tinkered with going back to 18 because they thought the revenue they'd make from the alcohol sales would be superior to the highway money they get because they're the most rural state in the country as far as highway miles go. So those are the things when you get involved, it's great when somebody says, 
hey, get a grant or get this money. What I would tell you is there's nothing for free. There's no such thing as free money. It doesn't exist. There's always something that gets you. There's something that you got to comply with, and it may not be what your community wants, but if you want the money, you got to do it. So those are the things you got to balance. It just seems like it's too much to expect of you as an individual. I'm not going to get upset if you share that opinion with some of the people I work for. I'll be okay with it. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions? Sonny? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, and the administrative overtime is just you, the deputy, and the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Are you on overtime now? <laughs> no, I'm so. <laughs> uh, I can't be on overtime. I didn't think you could. No. That's, what, that's my question. I'm not on overtime. So who's question. getting paid overtime? The justice The prosecutor. Prosecutorial staff um, is overtime for administrative personnel, summer prosecutor's office support records, and then the computer development repair. So again, remember, I don't know if you remember, heard what I said, is we have three folks that do most of the work on our computer system in-house. Now there's times we have to bring out an outside vendor, but most of the stuff we can manage, if the uh, computer goes down, somebody can come in and reboot it, get it set back the way it needs to be. But that person needs to be paid. So I just, instead of paying that out of my patrol line or my lieutenant that does it, I want to accurately reflect moving forward what our costs are going to be as we try to do improve the IT, not only in the police department, but throughout the town. IT is a concern that I know they're working on up here at the town office. So I'm just trying to get my numbers in line so I can report back, this is what we really spend on our support. Uh, so, so that was the biggest so increase Basically, there. when the computers are down. And maintenance, there's certain times there'll be, an, a lot of times with the storage system we use, which is a system that most of the police departments use in this area, in order to be interoperable with them so we can all look at e each other's reports if we're dealing with the same customer, you have to have those uh, those links and patches, so these guys handle all of that in-house as opposed to bringing in an outside vendor. The other aspect is the same thing that I said with the fire department. You know, you're coming at a 6.29 yep. increase, and the residents are not going to have an increase in their income. Well, some will, some won't. No, so I'm concerned about a default budget coming. I have. I, sh I the, share your concern. <laughs> yeah, because you got the DPW with 30 years of problems backing up. I mean, you got a school, the academy being built that's bonded. Mm -hmm. You know, I just see a default budget coming. Yeah. And you, you very well could be right. The only thing I would offer is why I would say to support. You know, I don't know everybody else's budget. I know what we did. Uh, you know, I was very proud of the fact that. This is my fourth budget. The first three budgets yeah. I came in with the lowest increases. This year, I think I have the highest. I tried, I was, I, I was good for three years, honey, I'm sorry. Well, these are the but first two numbers we've seen. To so. your point, you, you make a very good point when you talk about we have all these issues at the wastewater treatment plant coming up. And I think one of the things we ought to really strive to do, and I say this as a taxpayer also, that you can pay me now or you can pay me later. It seems to be a lot of times in this town over history, when we went for the police station, it literally was falling down around the police officers. Yeah, no, we actually know. had officers injured because of things falling out of the ceiling and hit them in the head. Well, and I'd like to see that we don't wait till the things break down before we do that. So I share your concern about the default. My only thing is there are things that need to be done so we don't run into a wastewater treatment plan I'm issue. I'm not questioning that. the... I'm not no, I, I, I'm yeah. sharing you as a, as a fellow I mean, taxpayer. The, the retirement system, you know... 20 years from now, the, the residents are going to be paying the shortfall because they projected the returns of 8 percent, now 7 percent. Have you read the most recent year, things on the on the retirement so. system? Have you read the most recent stuff on the retirement system? I think you'll be your fears will be alleviated on that one. I think some people fan that to scare the public because they just don't like what we get. Well, the shortfalls aren't that. what they. You know, the retirement system is based on the liabilities of people's pensions, you know, right. and yeah. they're not contributing, so it's all, the towns can't, Absolutely. can't pay it off, all they, all Hampton can do is set up a reserve, because I mean, 
we're going to have a, probably at least a half a million dollars shortfall. I agree with those issues are all concerning, but yeah, we, I no. still think we have to maintain a level of service to the taxpayer, and I think that's what they'll truly decide and want. Anybody else? Yes. Tim? If I must. Go ahead. You don't have to, Tim. Sure, Rich? Go ahead. Let's go. <laughs> Just so people at home know, we get a uh, book, and in that book we get a bunch of line items and with totals on them, and then we have details that back up those sub-line items. Oh. <clears throat> and it has a total on it. Which one's wrong? Which is wrong. Which one's wrong? That's I don't know. That's my question. The the detailed one the detailed one has um, twenty seven thousand eight hundred and five dollars more than the one with the subline items. So which one? If you would. Page, page thirty <coughs> reflects Twenty-seven thousand eight hundred five dollars more than what we just motioned for. Now, I was seeking out where the potential might be, and I saw there was a, a, a note. Um, What's the difference, though? I just told you. Thirty thousand. Twenty-seven thousand eight hundred five dollars. I, I noticed that thirty thousand dollars differential. And I, I thought that must be it, and I realized no. It's the difference is actually twenty-seven thousand eight hundred five dollars. It's kind of an odd number, literally. Um, yeah. I'm going to take a guess at this. Yeah. That so that's something for maybe Christy to deal with. The, the, the policy it. went out. And the gas went out. Yeah. Two items. The deputy's right here. He's very good at this. Price of gas. We we altered to adjust. Be to what September's number, yeah, which went up, right. and we dropped it a thirty thousand dollar line. Item. That I saw. I'm about to ask you about that in a minute. So hold that on. was hold a on. hold on that. All right. All right. So, so that's what I believe is the difference. So the number that I moved, Christy, is that not the number that the number I moved is is twenty seven thousand eight hundred five dollars less. Every year we go in, we get a, the detail part of the budget is what has been submitted by the department head, and that those numbers never change. To the column that's requested, which is column F on your summary sheet. Okay. And then I always put notes in bold of any lines that have changed. So, so, so the real de the real delta here is a reflection of change from the department head to town manager. Right. From requested. Right. To board of selectmen, and then oh, it the board will of selectmen. be from okay. requested to the budget committee. That's the two budgets. Okay. That's the money right there. Sir. Thank you for that clarification, Christy. I'm sure everyone on the committee noticed that Delta and wanted an explanation. I see your Citizens Academy here. Yeah. I love that name. We named it after you. I love that name. We named it after you. <laughs> <laughs> Did he pay for the naming rights? But the only thing we're going to do there is talk about the radio maintenance budget. How'd you know that was next? Ah, oh, jeez, I don't know, Tim. I'll well, stab at it. <laughs> okay, so we're replacing... Six. Let me get there. Hold on. Six twenty-eight. <laughs> Somewhere in your numerous subline items, you have think something called new equipment. You know, and uh, yeah, there it is. Oh. And there's nothing under new equipment. Yet under radio maintenance, you've got eighteen thousand dollars to buy six new portable radios. Yeah. Now, it seems to me buying six new portable radios constitutes new equipment, and it should be under new equipment, not under radio maintenance. Okay. All right? Again. So that's not a question, it's a statement. Okay. And I'm going to respond to your statement, if that's okay with you. Well, no, because I just, we went through this last year, and I don't want to go through it again. I, I thought we got to confirm. Long, I we're we're we trying to be expeditious this year. Trying to be expeditious. <laughs> All right. General maintenance for twelve thousand dollars. If you're buying these new radios, shouldn't the general maintenance be going down rather than be being maintained? Mm -hmm. You got general maintenance under radio maintenance, twelve thousand dollars. I think you are confusing the portable radios with the radios we have in the building, the main mm -hmm. part of the uh, infrastructure, the radio system that has what, we have four voter towers. These four voter towers we have in the town or just outside of the town pointing back in that's more a reflection of that not the portable radios what kind of maintenance is required there 
Well, we had an issue where recently the water company was painting one of the water towers where we have some of our equipment. Mm -hmm. So in order for them to accomplish that, we had to go in and move our equipment. So we had to pay somebody to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so stuff like that. Or so something the, water, the, the aquarium needed to, to paint their water towers? It was, it was something they were doing on the water tower that required us to move where our antenna and our apparatus was to support did it. Did you charge them for it? No, Tim, I did not. Okay, I, don't, I don't have the ability to charge the aquarium. That's not under my authority. Also, well, it was a detail. Did you float it up to the authority that could charge them? No, I didn't. Okay, thank you. Um, moving right along. I note that you've got uh, new police cars of three, okay. 20,000 apiece, which includes computers, right? How much did you say? 20? What page are you on, Tim? 26. 26. Thank you. Mm. <coughs> and the vehicle replacements. Okay. It seems accurately named, by the way. Thank you. So what is your question? I'm just mm -hmm. confirming that you're buying three marked police cars, cruisers. Yes. $28,000. And as you said earlier, when you buy a cruiser, you get a computer with it, right? Yes. So that $28,000 per, per cruiser includes a computer, correct? I think if you look up a little bit, they'll answer your question. Thanks, but Next, just spread up, Tim. The next replacement equipment. The next lineup. Cruiser setup installation. Oh, so it does not. It's there twenty-eight thousand does not include. No, that's about. That was last year's state bid price, uh -huh. which we believe every indication is the state bid price is going to remain that, or just a little bit more. So the twenty-eight thousand does not reflect the, the computer. computer. No. Okay. No. So if you throw in the computer and blah blah, you've got. Basically, uh, installation of emergency equipment is three thousand. That's uh, one thousand per cruiser, right? No. Okay. It says three at three thousand. Okay. So, so that means so it's three thousand. If you walk over to the right, okay. yeah, it's three thousand. Yeah. And laptop, you got three thousand for you know uh, that. So mm -hmm. that's six. Then you got a cruiser radio, which is another three thousand dollars, which is, makes a total of nine for a cruiser. Mm -hmm. So your per cruiser cost is coming in at uh, thirty-seven. Thank you, uh, You're welcome. That's why you're on the school board. Absolutely. So you, your actual cost is your actual cost is basically thirty-seven thousand yeah. dollars per cruise. And that's one. I just want to highlight that. And somehow, uh, well, I don't, I don't know. I shouldn't say somehow because I know exactly how it's happening. You're getting uh, thirty thousand dollars taken out of the fire and police detailed fund, the famous fund twenty-six. Um, okay. Now, we spoke briefly earlier. I just want to drill down a little bit here. You've got uh, a line item for consultants here, which was... Uh, which line are you addressing? We'll say on page 26, the consultants. Okay. Uh, you had 33500 for that. It was cut out by 30000 by somebody. I assume Board of Selectmen could have been town manager. I don't know. Um, it says manage administration, so I guess it was town manager. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Did the thirty thousand? So you asked for thirty-three and a half thousand dollars for consultants. That was your for that one, yeah. Yeah, and thirty thousand for the for the uh, the policy review and update. Right, and time is thirty thousand too much, basically. Essentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do with thirty-five hundred? I mean, is thirty-five thousand useful to you in any way? That's the remaining amount, thirty-five hundred. Well, it, it will be useful in the area of some of the other items that you see listed there. Um, seminars, consultant class to provide training seminars. Now, that line item could be far higher. <coughs> but one thing saves us from that is that we host a lot of the regional training yeah. here in Hampton Beach. Yeah, the, the nice building. So when we get those, what that saves me is... Cost of travel and all that good stuff. Tuition, yeah. travel, mm -hmm. lodging, and food. So what are we, by pulling 30000 out of here, what are we not funding? What we're not funding is my hope had been to get a, uh, an outside entity to come in and take our policies, and that's what they do. They look at policies, and they look at state law and federal law, state case law, federal case law, and develop model policies. Our policies are good, but it's a constant 
change based on the changes in law and case law. And what we would have the opportunity to do by having an, an outside person come in and look is to validate what we have, mm -hmm. add what we need, and also give us a, a way to verify the training level that our officers receive because a policy is only as good as the person that knows the policy. I can have all the policies I want, but if you don't get the proper instruction mm -hmm. and a, a validation of that instruction, when it comes time to go into a lawsuit, that, those are the first things they expose on you. So we want to get... Basically an attempt to, um, to a policy level, or rather um, an audit on your policy on an operational level with regard to laws, particularly as they've changed since the last time it was done. That Everything. Everything from use of force to internal affairs to how to wear a uniform. There, there are model policies out there, and the companies we looked at, they specialize in that, and they also give you that verification electronically. So an officer can come in off the road, mm -hmm. and we can say, this week's module is going to be this policy. You're required to sign in, and we can see that you signed in. Most of these companies have a small, you know, an easy quiz or test on the policy that we can see that they did and verify that and update easily as changes come, mm -hmm. as opposed to having, say, every five, four to five years having to do a, a, a review and a, and a renewal of our policies, which I mean, is very time consuming. Much more time to change. Well, well, be honest, much more I'd spend more money in staff changes. time doing it yeah. than I would 30000 by an outside company doing it, uh -huh. in my opinion. I think we'd spend more time in staff doing it on our own. <clears throat> that last statement suggests that you're saying it's more uh, Financially efficient to actually spend. I think it's more cost dollars. effective. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll speak to that in a moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. I made several notations because you know how I love your department. Laura fan. The, um, the chairman raised the uh, computer support on page twenty-one. It's a whopping, basically, three hundred dollars a month, thirty-six hundred dollars a year. It's not a big item, but for what's being detailed here, and I know it's a bit dated, but by, by uh, divining what what service you're getting from these things that are specified in outdated fashion, even that three hundred dollars seems a bit much. I'd like to know more detail on that and we can just do that privately and I just which want, three I'm sorry just so I'm thirty six hundred dollars it's listed for uh, annual internet service website email and the non DSL connection okay um, just we can do that uh, one on one okay. Uh, okay. and you may have an answer for you if you want to hear it now or you want to wait no we'll do it offline okay sure too small of a line item to take up the committee's time. <coughs> actually, actually, Chief, since you asked the question, Chief, could you answer it? I want to have the deputy answer that. He's a little bit more proficient in the technology, so. <laughs> please, please, so everybody knows. Yep. We upgraded to how our computers talk to the station so that officers in the cruiser can run uh, queries, license checks, record checks, whatnot. It's how it, it's it's basically a uh, like a mobile Wi-Fi or a MiFi you call them, and it talks to the station so that it's a connection point from the car to the station. Each car has a, uh, a mobile device that gets wired in and connected, um, and it just allows the computer to talk to base. Wow, that's a totally a different model. level of service than what's delineated here in the. Was the computer in the car talking to the? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I mean, I can do that with my own car computer with the phone company, for example. I'd be the same kind of. Uh, uh, connection with the internet, for, for example. Right? Same technology for communication is what I mean. You get a little portable device you can carry around. And, you know. I, I, if you could, again, if you could update that line item so it's more descriptive. Sure. Uh, appreciate that. Um, Chief, you got a raise this year, did you know? This year? 2017? 2017, yeah. Um, one point something, I believe, or two points off the... 1.25. thank you. 1.65. 1.65. Thank you. Now, Chief, there's this thing out there that I refer to as the Ocean Boulevard fence. I certainly know what I'm talking about, right? No, I don't. We put up a fence now, 
Parnassian Boulevard in the summertime. Crowd control gates you're talking about? Oh, crowd control what? Gates. Gates. Okay. <coughs> crowd control. I'll try to remember that term. Crowd control. Offense. Did they come out of your budget? Um, yes. And how much was that? Roughly just under $15,000. And that was for the <laughs> purchase, right? Yes. Before we were leasing them from some other town, was that right? No, we had uh, previously we we owned our uh, section of our own, but it wasn't sufficient to accomplish what we wanted, so we borrowed some from the uh, city of Lawrence, Massachusetts. They were kind enough to we had loaned ours to them for one of their festivals, and they were kind enough to reciprocate and loaned us their fence. But that became problematic because some of the events that we wanted to use it for, they had events going in their city, so we couldn't get the amount that we wanted. So we decided to make the purchase. Okay. Um I heard you say that we already had some existing fence. Yeah, yeah, about 36 pieces. Versus what, what did we buy for 15000 uh, We bought it, I'm sorry, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but we bought enough Perfect. on top of the fence we had, and I'm sorry I don't have the measurements, I wish we had known what I was going to talk about this, because I had it detailed, but basically we bought enough fence on top of what we had to go from G Street all the way to Mrs. Mitchell's on the west side of Ocean Boulevard, and then on the east side, the entire front of the, the uh, state seashell complex, so uh, F Street to D Street, enough to cover that area. Uh, sorry, I don't have the numbers for you, Tim. If I know we were going to talk about it, I would have. Right, we had previously owned some of that fence. About 36 <coughs> pieces of eight foot fence. But we didn't deploy those at the beach, did we? Yes, we did. We did? Okay. What we did, what, historically what we had been doing, we started doing that uh, back when I was deputy chief. and. When we started really seeing the decrease in the number of officers that we could get to work uh, as a whole, and then 4th of July in particular, yeah. I had traveled around and seen this fence used in other places to help keep crowds out of the road. Mm -hmm. So the section from D Street to C Street, which on the 4th of July causes probably the biggest right. traffic nightmare we have. That's wise, right? Yeah, it yeah. does. And by the time we get the road quit and then to keep the crowd out of the road so we could get the traffic flowing, and that one block area would take anywhere from eight to ten officers that I no longer had just simply because between us and the state police, we didn't have the numbers to do it. How long do we own that, that, that fence? Which, uh, the, 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 fence that we the first fence? Apparently in many years. To the, so I took over in 2014. I want to say somewhere around 2011, 12, we bought the first fence, somewhere in there. And, and uh, every year we, we put it up once and take it down once, is that right? We used it for other events, but primarily it was bought to use for the 4th of July. No, I mean presently, I mean based on this, this year. year. we did that. After I made We're that, putting it up once and then taking it down once, right? That's what we did this year. We put it up just before doing the 4th. that subsequently years, is that correct? Huh? Planning on doing that subsequent years as well. Yes, that is my game plan. Okay, and who's installing and uninstalling these fences? Is it you or DPW? Uh, combination. Uh, whoever we can get to help. Public Works is a great asset, but sometimes we have to go back and redo it, or if they're not available, we'll put out portions of it. Sometimes it takes more than one time at it. We'll do one side or a section and then come back and do the other section later. Well, I'm chasing, I'm, I'm on a chase down cost on that because uh, from what I see, uh, this is a necessary thing to do. Public safety. I agree. And um, they work fantastic this year. Well, they are they're very functional in terms of their intent. Absolutely. I mean, anyone can can see that. But they are for public safety mm -hmm. on state property. Yes. Which is in fact part of the property that was not transferred in 1933, not subject to the 1933 agreement. But yet we are subsidizing the state with this exercise because we must provide public safety period, whether it's in a contract from the sale of the beach or not. But that doesn't apply here, because we're talking about the state highway, different piece of land, right? And so I'm trying to nail down the actual cost that we're, <coughs> we're bearing here relative to subsidizing the state. So I just wanted you to know why I was asking those questions. I do think well, the fence is... The only thing I would offer on this, Tim, is work. if you're going to ask this question, yeah. are you then in turn going to request data on how many stops we've made on Ocean Boulevard, because that's a state road, are we going to try to build I believe uh, Sleckman have been already pursuing that information with you, particularly Bean, is he not? I supply them with data on um, activity on state properties, not state roads. State roads, 
we are obligated as a police department right. to enforce the laws on any roads in the town of Hampton. Right. The only roads that we don't have primary jurisdiction on is Route 95, and under the recent change, uh, state police can uh, come in on 101 also and do those things. But these fences, as I understand it, its primary purpose is to control pedestrian traffic. Yes. Right. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, which is distinctly different than speeding tickets. Yes. So, I mean, that's that's where kind of like I'm seeing the difference here. Basically, it's kind of sidewalk maintenance in some respect. You're like enforcing that people use the sidewalk. I'm going to have more to less. disagree with you on that analogy. <laughs> it's fine. It wasn't a question, it was a statement. Yeah. So was mine. Uh, I think that your your thirty thousand dollar back to your thirty thousand dollar consultant, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, w I would like to, to uh, take the vote on the, the motion that's in place, but I'd like an opportunity to make a motion to uh, add thirty thousand dollars subsequent to that vote. Yeah, I was just going to ask why you're suggesting it's going to save money in the long run. I yes, I am to spend that thirty thousand dollars and it seems to make sense to me why would we um, take that out that's okay T uh, timmy you're done yeah i was just saying that you know I i'd like to proceed with the motion on the table and then yes. make another motion where we can discuss that that's of course that's what just what we'll do Did anybody else have any questions uh steve Chief, what are some of the departments across the state that are using that policy? I know like some of them, like Nash was accredited, certain departments have gone through the accreditation process. What are they, do they use a process like this? Or what other department uses a, this type of a policy and rule procedure? With CALEA, you develop a policy and procedures and everything from how you operate your building to the arrest facilities, policies on how you arrest, handcuff, they have model policies all in all of that. Now, usually when you're going for a career accreditation, you appoint a accreditation manager, okay? And for about a two-year period, that becomes their primary task. If, you, if you're an agency that's never been accredited before, and you're going for it, that original accreditation, it is a daunting task. If we were to try to pursue that, that would pretty much be Deputy Chief Hobbs, 90% of what he would be doing for the next two years would be developing those policies between implementation, meeting with the accreditation team from Kuwait coming down, and then ultimately at the end, they come in and do a final review, which is about a, a week and a half to 10 day odyssey, where they come in and they go through everything and test you on it and make sure our officers, right down to the custodian, know how you operate your police department. Very expensive, uh, prestigious to, to, to get that. What we're talking about is coming is not Kalia. We're talking about just having contemporary policies that will meet the test of anything that we would be thrown at in a say a civil uh, matter. Somebody comes after us and saying that you know what we did in our booking room was not an appropriate tactic. What we want to be able to show is this is our policy. It's been validated. This officer is the officer involved, he's been trained in it, and here's the video that shows he followed the policy. That's our best defense, having updated policies that protect the town and protect the liability of, of that risk management. So, what I'm really wondering is who actually is using this program now? I mean, who, what departments around the state of New Hampshire? Do we have some departments that currently use it? There's, uh, there's, there's three companies outside of CLIA that'll, that do this type of thing across the country. One doesn't work in New Hampshire because they, they don't have the legal expertise. Their attorneys haven't practiced in New Hampshire yet. So it gets you down to two. The, the one that we're looking at, um, he's based out of Connecticut. He's all over the country. He is not in New Hampshire. Um, he's in everywhere else across the country, but uh, there are no um, agencies in the state that have used it. I've talked to some down in Connecticut that have used it that speak very highly of them. Um, our agency over the last several years has started sending people to um, uh, summits that he puts on, uh, tr like two, three day training sessions. And we're kind of adopting a lot of his use of force stuff. Um, so it works well for us. We've incorporated a lot of his uh, concepts into what we what it is we do nowadays. And in my opinion, I think this, this would get us to meet the accreditation level of policies without the whole accreditation process, but it is the policy process that
update those policies to that accreditation standard that is important for currently there's nobody in the state of New Hampshire that's currently using it that's no. using this guy no the individual we're talking about I don't mind sharing it he, he, he's a public figure his name is Eric Daigle he's a former Connecticut state trooper and now an attorney he is the primary use of force attorney for the International Association of Chiefs of Police which is a fairly prestigious organization uh, that we're members of um, and he gives most of the legal advice uh, to the ICP on all things use of force. That is his specialty. There's no question. I mean, thirty thousand dollars can be eaten up pretty quick by you know reviewing policy rules and procedures, as well as taking all the time you know that could be put into other avenues. So certainly, uh, it's a small amount for something of updating policies, rules, and procedures. Anybody else? Seeing none.